Thank you, Jana. And I want to say hello, Kennesaw State University. And to President Whitten, to other administrators, faculty members, the organizing committee, faculty and staff. I want to say that I am, and of course you students, I am very honored to be here today to talk with you a bit and to share in this celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s 90th birthday, actually, had he lived. Two days ago, he would have been 90. But I unabashedly say that Dr. King is my hero because he played a pivotal role in my life from the 60s and beyond until today. I want you to close your eyes and reflect on some of the things I'm going to share with you, and it won't be very long. I want you to think about what if you had to go to a black segregated school that had no library, it had no playground or lunchroom, and all of your books were books from white schools that were used. Many had pages torn out or things scribbled in them. What if you had to, when you wanted a drink of water, go to the water fountain and see that there were two? one for white and one for colored. How would you feel? What if you had to ride at the back of the bus or the streetcar? Yes, we did have streetcars back when I was growing up. Or any public transportation, just because of your race or the color of your skin. What if you were denied entrance to restaurants, to movies, to concerts and other public events? What if you, when going to a department store, could not try on clothing before you bought it? You had to just buy it and hope that it fit. How would you feel? This is, and you can open your eyes if you close them, this was the world in which my childhood was born. And as a child growing up, I had some problems with some of those things, as I'm sure you would. But I couldn't do anything about it. I was growing up in Atlanta and the Deep South and those things were expected. They were called Jim Crow laws. People had problems in being able to vote because although the vote was given to everyone in, I think, 1948, some people were killed if they tried to go and vote. There were a lot of limitations. But thank God today, you don't have those problems. Now, most of them, and mind you, I said most, most of them have been solved. And how and why? Well, it was largely due to the work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. with his vision for America and with all of the people who worked with him to institute a feeling of love and brotherhood for all people and of non-violence. We are all beneficiaries. When I think about those days, and people often ask me, well, how did you become involved? Well, I went to Turner High School. It was the, quote, silk stocking high school for black students at that time. And yes, it was segregated. I went as a part of the first graduating class. It was brand new when we went. And guess what? We had new textbooks for the first time. 
for me. I was there from 53, I'm sorry, I was there from 51 to 53. I graduated in 53. Charlene Hunter, now Hunter Galt, and Hamilton Holmes also attended Turner High School. But they were five years after me. In other words, I was five years older. I had watched their trial in terms of getting to the University of Georgia. They had been, I think it was 18 months that it took for them to be admitted. And you saw or you heard on the, the documentary the fact that there was a riot on campus. I was teaching at the time, I was in my fourth year of teaching music at John Hope Elementary School. And when I went home and looked at the, the evening news with my mom, because I was still living with her at the time, a little black and white television, I couldn't believe there was a riot going on at the University of Georgia. You see, Charlene and Hamilton were admitted by court decree. It was not a voluntary thing. There had been a long 18-month fight to keep them out. And students were upset. They said it was because they had just lost a basketball game to Georgia Tech. But actually, it's felt that, I don't know if it was ever proven, that riot was planned. But I looked at it and I said, that's not right. They can't do that. These are my fellow Turnerites. They should have been able to protect them. And I said to my mom, I know what I can do. I know what I can do. I have been watching the student movement in Atlanta. It started in Greensboro, North Carolina, as you know, with lunch counter protests. But in Atlanta, the university um, system students decided that they were tired of all the things that I just described, and there were more. And so they were marching in the streets, they were picketing, they were sitting in at lunch counters, and as a young teacher, I wanted to do something. I wanted to help them, but I couldn't. Because I was hired by the state, I would have been fired. But my answer came that night after watching that riot. I said, I know what I can do. I can transfer from the University of Michigan where I had been studying for three summers and, and apply to the University of Georgia. My mom said, are you crazy? That's not a place you want to go because it's dangerous. You just saw a riot. And I said, mom, this is something I just have to do. And so she agreed to support me, and she did. But in going, it wasn't like when you came to Kennesaw State where you sent in your application and you had your transcripts sent. Uh, if you had any problems, you could come and talk with someone and possibly you could still get in. But the state of Georgia had decided that they did not want to admit black students. In fact, Governor Vandiver, Ernest Vandiver was governor at that time, and he said, no, not one black will integrate the public schools of Georgia, and he meant that. They passed a law that said that no one past the age of 25 could apply to Georgia. That was not a, a good decision because they were losing money. But at any rate, um, the two students who got in got in by court order. And I had decided to go on my own. I was, no one selected me. No one asked me to go. I made that decision. And people say that I was an unlikely candidate for a civil rights activist. Perhaps so. But something told me that this was the right thing to do. One of my favorite quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is, the time is always right to do what is right. And I felt at that moment that I was doing the right thing. I didn't know if I'd get in, 
But I did know that I had graduated from elementary, high school, and college as valedictorian. I didn't think that they could question my academic record. But I had no idea what they had in store or what was in store for me. Because I had to go to the courthouse, the Fulton County Courthouse, and have the court judge to sign my application saying that I was a model citizen. I don't know how he was supposed to know. but. Um, I did that. And then there was an investigative report done on me, except at the time, I did not know that. They were trying to find ways, they tried to pull every trick out of the book to find ways to not allow me in. They already had two black students who weren't wanted, and they didn't want a third one, even though Charlene and Hamilton were undergraduates, and I was going to integrate the graduate school because I had been going I had been doing graduate study. But this investigative report, it was something like an FBI report. They had done one on Charlene and Hamilton. I knew that. But I didn't know they were investigating me, too. You have to be careful, folks, because you don't know who's watching you. Well, they wanted to know if I had, uh, if the State Department had reported me as having a venereal disease, if I had shoplifted, if I had been arrested. And actually, they, they investigated my whole family, even my father, who was dead. He died when I was 12. They investigated my brother and found that he had two uh, tickets. I think they were parking tickets. I'm not sure. But they wanted to know if I had had an illegitimate child. And so the next step was to go down to Athens for an interview with the registrar, Walter N. Danner. I never got an invitation. So during the school system's spring break, I wrote and told them I was coming down during the spring break to have my so-called required interview, and I went. I was interviewed first by the dean of the graduate school, Dean Huff. He was very nice, very, very amiable. We had a good conversation, and I felt you know, pretty good about it. He said he thought that my chances of getting in were very good because he'd seen my transcripts. But when I went to the registrar's office, the first question that I was asked was, have you ever been in a house of prostitution? And I thought, why is he asking me this? I don't think he would ask that of a white female. And then he said, you know, uh, you, you have spent some summers at University of Michigan, and we don't have to accept your credits. And you will lose all of that. And I said to him, what I have learned, I will never lose. And I still want to attend the University of Georgia. Well, it took them five months, finally, after the interview. It took five months for them to actually admit me. And I went down the summer of 1961, five months after Charlene and Hamilton had entered. Um, they had gone home for the summer because I knew they were tired of, of all of the bad treatment that they had received, including the riot. But also, Charlene had uh, a temporary job. I think she was an intern at the Louisville Times. And Hamilton was working as a lifeguard in Atlanta at one of the pools. So I was the lone black on campus. The main problem that I had was loneliness because no one wanted to speak to me. And I'm a naturally gregarious person, and I like, I like to talk with people, and I like people to talk with me. In fact, when I went to my first class, which was advanced history, and looked around at the cold faces and people who moved away from me, they did not want to sit close, and they would not say anything or recognize me. I wanted to just burst out singing, uh, we are friends, but I didn't. I knew that that wouldn't work. But anyway, the semester progressed, and I'm, I'm having to try and condense this because I can't tell my story in a short time. Uh, I was able to do very well my first two quarters because there were two quarters during the summers, and I was in, in encouraged by my, my uh, professor, my advisor, to take a leave of absence from the Atlanta Public Schools 
and come back for the spring quarter and the summer quarter of 62, and I could perhaps get my degree. I went home and started back teaching, because you see, teachers have to go to school during the summer. You can't go unless you are, are rich. You can't go during the school year. And I went back, and I was really happy to get back to my teaching and to my students. I talked with my principal, and he was, he was all for it. He said, of course, I'll hold your job. You go ahead and apply for the spring quarter. I talked with my mom, and I was concerned because I was really uh, participating in household expenses, and I didn't want her to suffer because of my decision. But she said, no, I told you I would support you, so you go ahead. It'll be all right. And then there was help from the community. Dr. Horace Tate, who was the executive secretary of the GTEA, which was the Georgia Teacher Education Association. That was the association for black teachers. The GEA was the association for white teachers. They were still segregated. He wrote a letter to the teachers in Georgia, and he asked them to contribute one or two dollars toward my coming back so I could finish my master's degree. And they did. I couldn't believe it. I had no idea. You see, when I took leave of absence, I would not have a salary. I would not have a pension. I would not have health insurance. But God is good. He made that happen for me. And so I graduated in August of 1962. And I knew it was a momentous moment because for 175 years, Georgia had been all white. And now they had a black who had finished. And after me, many others would come. I just met a, a young woman who's a professor, I think, who's a 1970s graduate of Georgia. Whatever it is that you want to do, young people, you can do it. I think about Dr. King's speech, his iconic speech, I Have a Dream. He said, from the red hills of Georgia, I can see blacks and whites and Gentiles and Jews sit down together at the table of brotherhood, just as we're sitting today. He said, I want my children, my four children, to be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That was his dream. When I finished the uh, University of Georgia, one of my prized possessions is a letter that I got from Dr. King. And in it he said, I feel as though you are a member of my church rather than a visitor, because I would always go to his church just to hear his, his sermons about nonviolence and brotherhood. But he also said, you have brought Atlanta, Georgia, and the nation closer to the American dream. And that makes me think about another song about dreams, The Impossible Dream. How many of you have heard that song? The Impossible Dream was sung by um, Don Quixote in a musical back in, I think, 1965. And I'll try to remember the words. To dream the impossible dream to fight the unbeatable foe, to bear with unbearable sorrows, to run where the brave dare not go, to right the unrightable wrongs, to love pure and chaste from afar, to try when your arms are too weary to reach the unreachable star. This is my quest, to follow that star, no matter how hopeless, no matter how far, to be willing to fight for the right and to march into hell for a heavenly cause. And I know if I'll only be true to that glorious quest that my heart will lie peaceful and calm when I'm laid to my rest. And the world will be better for this, that one man or woman, scorned and covered with scars, still strove with his last ounce of courage to reach the unreachable star. Young people, there are no 
unreachable goals. You are our hope for the world. If you can help to achieve Dr. King's dream, you know that he, his, after his I Have a Dream speech, he lived only five additional years because he was assassinated in 68. Did his dream die with him? No. It is still alive. And we of the older race pass the torch on to you and ask you to take up that mantle and to help make Dr. King's dream come true. Thank you for your attention.